So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, I will first give you a, a very brief introduction to, to Danish agriculture. Then I'll talk a bit about why should we tax pesticides and, and how. I'll then go to a presentation of the Danish pesticide tax design from 1996 to 2013, uh, the old tax, and talk a bit about the effects of, of the old tax. Then I'll turn to the effects, to the design of the new, more environmental tax uh, from 2013. And I'll talk a bit about the effects uh, of the 2013 tax. There are some limitations to how much I can say because it's, a, as I said, it's a running project. And therefore I can't go very deep down into the details of the 2013 tax. But I have the, some indications on, on the effects. Uh, we. The idea is that we will uh, publish uh, the study in early autumn, I think. I'll also talk a bit about some a few concerns regarding uh, pesticide uh, taxation and then uh, also address uh, transferability to, to other countries. So, in Denmark we have quite a long uh, history of taxing uh, uh, pesticides. Uh, we have some pesticide taxation actually going way back to, to the 70s, uh, but at that time it was not intended to have any effects. It was more like an administrative fee. Um, and basically what we can say is that until the, the recent redesign, there hasn't been a great effect of, of Danish uh, pesticide taxes. But uh, overall, the new pesticide tax appears to, to deliver on, on some of the promises, but I'll get back to that. So most of you know that uh, we are neighbors here. So we have Denmark with a pop population of uh, approximately 5.7 million people, uh, 43,000 uh, square kilometers, and a GDP per capita of about 48,000 euros. It's a very intensive uh, farmed country, so about 61% uh, is, uh, is farmland of the country. Uh, main crops are cereals and uh, fodder crops, potatoes. According to the World Bank, uh, agriculture constitutes like 1.1% of uh, Danish GDP in 2017. We also have a lot of uh, focus on uh, drinking water in Denmark, because in Denmark we drink untreated uh, groundwater. I think in Sweden it's a more uh, surface water, uh, drinking some groundwater, but also surface waters in uh, protected areas. But in Denmark it's untreated groundwater. And that's why there's a lot of uh, focus on, uh, on having that unpolluted uh, groundwater still, both from the population and and from politicians. So why is it that we should tax pesticides? Uh, yeah, as you know, probably prices should reflect the externalities which are caused by the pesticides. Uh, so if there's a higher price, it gives an incentive to reduce the use of pesticides or switch to less harmful products. Uh, theoretically, of course, it would be optimal if we could tax each and, and every farm according to how much uh, they emit, but that's very difficult because uh, it's a challenge when we have diffuse emissions like the ones from agriculture. Uh, administration costs of such a system would be very huge. So plan B is to tax business inputs and there we have uh, pesticides, uh, fertilizers is another example, but I won't be addressing that uh, today. I know you have some experiences on, on fertilizer taxation in, in Sweden. Uh, but you tax them because they're assumed to be good proxies for, for some of the negative effects. But needless to say, the tax design is, is very important for the effects. From, and that's the background for why Denmark uh, introduced a, a tax back in 1996. 
at that time, for 10 years, we had a pesticide action plan where we tried to reduce uh, use of uh, pesticides by 50% uh, due to a broad uh, political agreement back in 1986. Uh, at that time, a true environmental tax was uh, discussed in, in 96, but the different ministries, they couldn't agree on, on having a true uh, environmental tax. So they couldn't provide the necessary data to assess the negative effects of pesticides. And therefore, uh, they had to give up on that plan. And instead, uh, an ad valorem uh, pesticide tax was introduced in, in 96. The aim was to reach a treatment frequency index at 1.7. And treatment frequency index that's uh, an indicator for pesticide use. So basically, the treatment frequency index says how many times can the whole agricultural land of Denmark be treated with the standard dose, meaning that on average, all <coughs> agricultural land in Denmark got a treatment of 1.7 standard doses if we reached that level. So it's it's a sort of uh, of having a better indicator than, for instance, uh, use of active ingredients. Uh, treatment frequency index was, was considered a better indicator than just simply measuring the amount of active ingredients uh, like many other countries do. Uh, and economists and uh, horticulturists, they assessed uh, based on the economic calculations, that the level of 1.7 would be economically optimal for the farmers. Uh, when we had a tax like the one uh, described it below, if farmers acted economically optimal, then we would reach that level of 1.7. Actually, they assessed that maybe it was possible to go as far down as 1.4 but they chose the upper boundary and said, okay, 1.7 should be the goal. So the tax levels were 37% uh, uh, on top of the price of insecticides, and then 15% on top of uh, the price of fungicides and herbicides and growth uh, regulators. But very soon after, uh, they could see that there was a lack of uh, effect of, of the tax. And therefore, already in, in 1998, uh, the tax was uh, doubled on average and reached a level of 54% on in insecticides and 33% on in fungicides, herbicides, and growth regulators. The revenue was, uh, for a large part of it, uh, reimbursed to the sector. Uh, it happened primarily through a reduced uh, land tax. So farmers got their land tax reduced. And that actually meant if you were a very good farmer and you reduced uh, the amount of uh, pesticides used, then because you got a lower land tax, then you could actually get a plus in, in the calculation. So if you were very good at, at reducing pesticides, you would have to pay less uh, pesticide tax and you were reimbursed uh, through the uh, reduced land tax. Of course, if you were a poor farmer and uh, or due to other circumstances couldn't reduce your consumption, then uh, you could get a minus in, uh, in that equation. So, but primarily through land tax, part of it was also given back uh, to the sector through uh, some uh, uh, funding for research within agriculture, etc., but most of it through reduced land tax. The effects from 1985 to 2012, here we can see the treatment frequency index, uh, and we can see here there were some expe expectations of, uh, of the tax introduced. And therefore, farmers, they bought a lot of uh, pesticides before, before the tax introduction. That's a well-known effect. When you know there's a new tax, you buy a lot of pesticides. And that's why it's difficult to see the effect uh, for those years. Uh, and here, they probably started to have used what they hoarded of pesticides. 
and therefore it was more stable. Then it fell for some years and actually we got close to the 1.7 which is down here. For some years there was a, a goal also of 2.0 as a middle range goal. That's that line there. But the problem was that you can see that the TFI started to increase through the 2000s and actually got very high here towards uh, uh, 2011, I think it is. So mm, question marks around, around the effects here. So what could be the reason why it was so difficult to get down to, to 1.7? One thing which we found in, when we made a survey, uh, which was published in, in uh, that study back in 2012, uh, we made a study to a survey to more than 1,000 Danish farmers, uh, or with responses from one, more than 1,000 Danish farmers. And here, cluster analysis uh, showed that uh, half of the farmers are very economically mot motivated. But there was one third of, third of the farmers which were more focused on, on maximizing physical yield. We could see they were less focused on, on prices on both crops and pesticides. Uh, so you can say that they were not primarily motivated, motivated by prices as you would expect. Some of them could be said to be more motivated by for example, having a strong sense of professionalism. Uh, here we can see, uh, I took one of the old tables here where we can see some, some farmer motivations. Uh, it's on a, on a scale from one to five and uh, there's a mean score out here. And not surprisingly, on average, farmers focus most on, on greatest crop yield. Uh, and then we see some, some different other types of motivation here. Down here we find a, a bit lower. Uh, the price of, of herbicides and how much it motivates when they make their decisions uh, and some other issues. We also have uh, this table of uh, risk perceptions where we can see how do you assess the risk of the use of plant protection chemicals with regard to the following issues? And there we, what gained the largest score was the re risk of uh, reduced yield from reducing the use of PBCs. So that's uh, the risk the farmers were mostly concerned about. Uh, second, uh, almost all, the, all other types of risk are, are pretty close to each other. Uh, so we see scores between 2.5 and, and 2.7, so it's, it's very close to, to the mean of, of, uh, of the scale uh, at 2.5. No, at, at 3, of course. Uh, so, but we also see that, that there is quite a lot of uh, division here between the farmers, so it's quite a lot spread all over the all over the scale, so, so there's some variation between the farmers and how they uh, assess the risk. Uh, size and type of farm uh, also influences decision making. What we could see was that, uh, that the larger farms uh, were less inclined to, to reduce pesticides and one explanation for that could be that it's difficult to know your weed spots in the field if you have more than 200 hectares. If you have a farm of, of only 50 hectares, there's a tendency that you better know your field and know where the weed spots are in that field. But when, when the area grows, you lose that and therefore you are, will probably more have a tendency just to use the same amount of pesticides all over the, uh, the field because you don't know all the spots. Um, of course, it can also have an influence if you have a livestock or an extra job, as, as many farmers do, uh, because it also demands, uh, demands attention from you, and that attention goes maybe from taking that, that extra turn in the field to know uh, the weed spots. But as I said, there are also variations in, in the decision rationale uh, across the farmers, as, as I demonstrated above. 
So why was it difficult to reach these aims? Yeah. CFI of 1.7 might be uh, economically optimal, uh, but not all farmers are acting 100% like economic men. Of course, they are acting to a certain degree. Uh, they are responding to price signals, but, but it's just not 100% economic men. Of course, there's some low price elasticity, and, uh, and it, uh, as you also said, there is uh, some risk averseness among the farmers. Another thing is that, that sometimes uh, some of the farmers might not always get the best advice from their agricultural advisors. We also did a, a survey among all Danish agricultural consultants some years ago. And for instance, we could see that there is a small difference on how uh, chemical companies uh, advices from chemical companies advice compared to independent chemical uh, advisors. It's not very surprising, but here, because there are, there are some indications in, in the literature on that issue, but here again we could show it quantitatively that there is uh, a small difference. So if you are an advisor coming from a company selling chemicals, there's a tendency uh, on average that you would that you would not recommend, recommend lower doses. Very often you can use a lower dose because it's uh, said as uh, if conditions are very poor, then you should use the highest dose, but normally conditions are for using a lower dose. But there we could see that, that the advisors coming from these chemical companies, they were less inclined to, to recommend lower doses compared to independent. Uh, consultants, and of course, farmers. Many of the farmers they rely very much on on their uh, agricultural consultant. It's a, a journal article will, which will hopefully get out during during the the spring. Uh, we've written there. Okay, then jumping to uh, the new pesticide plan. It was adopted in in June 2012. And here, the most important policy instrument was a revision of, uh, uh, of the pesticide tax. Uh, so we started to tax uh, differentiated according to the impact on, on free indicators. Uh, on general, we increased the tax rates also. I'll get back to, to the details in a, in a second. And again, like... Uh, with the first tax, uh, the increased revenue was in return to the farmers through reduced taxes on land. So again, uh, reimbursement of, of the extra revenue. The main objective this time was that we, we scrapped the treatment frequency index because the pesticide load indicators was developed in Denmark. Uh, and we wanted to reduce the pesticide load by 40% by 2015-16 compared with 2011. So, meaning, yeah, it doesn't say much to you, but we wanted to re reach a level of 1.96 on, on the pesticide load indicator, which was uh, similar to a 40% reduction of, of that. So now, for all commercial products, a pesticide load is calculated uh, and expressed as the pesticide load per unit commercial product. And as I said, there are three elements or free, free indicators. So there's one on human health, there's one on uh, ecotoxicology, and there's one on environmental fate. So basically, what are the effects on, on the uh, guys uh, spraying the pesticides? What are the effects on uh, non target uh, organisms? And how does, uh, what is the fate of, of the product? How does it seep down into the groundwater, for instance? The tax is composed of a basic tax and then these three elements uh, at some, some different levels, at, as you can see there. The average tax was increased by 125%, so a huge uh, tax increase uh, compared to the old tax. 
And the estimations were that of the revenue, te approximately 10% would come from, from the basic part of the tax and then 30% from each of, uh, of the load taxes. And it meant that there were very huge differences in the price levels on, on the different pesticides. Some pesticides became very expensive, uh, and some uh, fell in price and some uh, kept their prices, but there was a, a huge span. The assessment of the indicators is based on, on the EU approval of, uh, of the active substance in the pesticides. Uh, so that's where the, the main part of the information uh, comes from. And you can see here what they actually wanted to have, because you can discuss indicators a lot, but, but the Danish authorities, they wanted to have uh, an extra focus on bees and pollinators, aquatic uh, organisms, and uh, products which uh, have a, a high risk for the groundwater due to the drinking water issues. Uh, so that's why some of those indicators are, are chosen. So you can see there are a lot of sub-indicators. -indi Here it's uh, effects on uh, non-target organisms, where we had birds, mammals, fish, daphnia, algae and etc, etc. Uh, and then some indicators for, for uh, environmental failure as well. Uh, I don't have the one on, uh, on health here because uh, I couldn't find it in, in that article. So, but, but basically a very complex uh, tax. So I took this citation from Kusk et al. 2018, where they say PL for human health is based on the risk basis on the product label, while PL for ecotoxicology is calculated on the basis of some other values. Uh, and PL for environmental fate is calculated on basis of half-life in soil and bioaccumulation and, and the psycho index. So what are, what are the effects then? Yeah, we start seeing the effects now. We had the same problem uh, when this tax was introduced uh, that uh, farmers, of course, hoard pesticides in particular when they know they get a, a, as high a tax as, as this uh, pesticide tax. So here you see the table for uh, pesticide load based on sales numbers. Then we have uh, the target here at 1.96, so the policy objective. Then we have a table here. I'm, uh, I'm colorblind, so I don't want to mention what color it is <laughs> to me. I'm red, red green, uh, colorblind, so, but this, this, is it red or? Orange. Orange, okay, great. It's my colleague who made it, and I always, <laughs> I always tell them, don't make it in green or or, yeah, or, or red, because you know, 10% of the male population is red, green, uh, colorblind, or something like that. Uh, and then uh, it's quite interesting because we also have the treatment frequency index here, so the old indicator. And it's interesting because the treatment frequency indicator is uh, increasing over time, but uh, the pesticide uh, load is, uh, is starting to fall. And the reason is, of course, treatment frequency index, it's standard doses. It doesn't say actually how, uh, what are the negative effects of this. It's just standard doses. So uh, it's still not a very good uh, indicator. Pesticide load is, of course, a lot better because it's, it's more environmental. So actually what we can see is that uh, the farmers, they use more standard doses on average, but the thing is that the products they use, they are not uh, as problematic as, as it was before, and that's why the pesticide load indicator is, is starting to fall now. So the Danish authorities, they wanted to reach this 40% uh, reduction in load, and actually they reached it based on sales figures uh, what is more interesting at the moment, the problem here in the first years was, of course, that, that the farmers hoarded a lot, and that's why it fell so much. It's more interesting to look at, at the orange one, because that is a, is a graph 
based on the farmer's spray journals. Each and every farmer has to, to make a spray journal where they write down how much uh, pesticides did I use this year. And uh, uh, from time to time, authorities, they check uh, the farmer's spray journals. Uh, they make some control uh, of spray journals that, that they, that they are, are made the correct way. And here we can see that uh, in 2016, we reached a reduction of minus a reduction of 15 percent in the pesticide load. So it's uh, it's still a bit far from the 40 percent, of course, but it's it's getting it's getting lower. And it's interesting to see uh, the newest figures. So there is a substitution towards some less uh, harmful uh, substances. Uh, and the tax appears to be working, so 15% is something at least. Of course, it can be discussed whether it is enough. Uh, it's interesting to see whether it will climb further down, but we'll have to see that in, in the coming years. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just in relation to how well the tax is working, I mean, the, you didn't say, do they, do they reimburse, do the authority reimburse like 90% of the money they collect? And, and that's not really a choice variable for them because the land size is something fixed. Mm. So, I mean, potentially you could have a situation with Danish agriculture, they, you have passive pollution and they all agree that we just increase the, the, the spraying, we will pay more, but we will get everything back mm. due to our lands. I mean, but, the, but the marginal effect of the tax is much lower because mm. of this reimbursement, uh, and it's not... Uh, but, it's but that was fixed, I'll, I'll get to that on, on the next... It's not like they can uh, uh, reduce the... Uh, but the thing was that, that if, if there were no behavioral effect, then there would be a tax revenue of 1.1 billion Danish kroners, because it was increased by, what was it, 125%. Uh, but. But what they calculated regarding the reimbursement was that they wanted to have that 40% reduction in sales. And therefore, the estimation was then to reach a level at 650 million. They all were already were reimbursed for the 500 million. And that was why they chose to reimburse only 150 million. So it's 150 million which is reimbursed because it is assumed that they should reach a level of 650 million in, in revenue. You, you get the reduced land tax, so it's based on your land value, and still you would have the incentive to reduce the amount of pesticides. But it's true, if, if, if they just reimbursed all revenue, then in the story would be a, diff, a bit different. I, I can see that argument also. But, but here it's important that it was only 150 millions which were lifted off the, off the land tax. Uh, so, uh, there, uh, it's, it's difficult in these years to, to say about the revenue, but uh, because these sales fi figures, they, they go a bit up and down at, at the moment and, and they are, they are finding uh, the level. But revenue realized has been about 550 million, but, but when all storage would probably be used now and therefore we start seeing uh, uh, the more exact uh, figures. We have also made a, a survey with 600 farmer responses this time because it's interesting to, to co combine that with the, the spray journals. Uh, but I can't say a lot of, about it because it's, it's, it's not out there yet and, and we have some limitation on how much we can say uh, according to our contract with the Ministry of Environment. But we can say that there are some indications that, that farm size and farm type matters again. And again, we see some, some clusters, but, but I can't get very much into to detail with that. And of course, there are some differences across some crops. As you mentioned, there, there can be differences between crops. As far as I recall, there were some, uh, some special possibilities of, of having smaller subsidies for potatoes and strawberries uh, because they're very uh, spray intensive and therefore there were some bargaining with regarding that that type of uh, those two crops which are also important crops in in Denmark according to the EPA a few crops 
uh, for a few crops, production area has decreased due to production cost increases, but minor effects. Pesticide resistance has been a, a huge issue in, in Danish agricultural uh, politics when discussing this tax. Uh, because, of course, there is a, a risk that some products are taken off the market, and we know that some products have been taken off the market. Uh, and therefore, you, you increase the risk of uh, pesticide resistance. Uh, according to the Danish EPA last year, for herbicides, there is a risk of increased resistance among some grass weeds if substitution towards what is called mini uh, midler in Danish, mini products uh, continues. But they say it can be solved by following integrated pest management principles, etc. For fungicides, they say that there's an increased resistance, but it's not due to the tax. I don't know the argument, what, what else it, it could be. Uh, but one of the problems for fungi is that in general, general there's a quite small supply of, uh, of active substances. For insecticides, they don't see any changes. Then we could also ask, would this uh, lead to illegal imports? When you have a very high tax, there's the risk that the farmer just drives to Germany and, and buy the products. Uh, the main Danish green NGO, uh, the Danish Society for Nature Conservation, I think you can't see it there, but it's mentioned as a source uh, below. They say that if prices increase, uh, oh sorry, they have some unconfirmed numbers from 2016, where they say that in 2% of, of 762 farm inspections, there were found some illegal substances which never have been allowed in Denmark. So, of course, there's a, a small risk that, that there are some products which go in. That is controlled by the authorities, but of course, it's, it is a possibility that some of it is, uh, gets through the net. Of course, there are some experiences in, in a lot of other countries regarding pesticides. I don't want to go through it here, but what we can say is, uh, regarding revenue, the Danish uh, pesticide tax is in a class of its own. Uh, Norway also has a pesticide tax which is uh, based on risk. They already introduced it in, in 1999 uh, and it generates about 50 million Norwegian kroners, but it's, it's fine. As I said, the Danish tax is tenfold, but of course there are also more farmers in Denmark. But I think tax levels are quite a lot higher in, in Denmark. So, and the Norwegian tax is based on, on seven different, or how was it, uh, Daniel, five different uh, tax, tax classes. What is also interesting is that many countries, they use development and sales of active ingredients as an indicator, but I don't think it tells us much. It's a lot better with this pesticide load indicator. One uh, last slide I just want to say, to show you here is, that it would be very interesting to be able to compare a lot more between the countries. Some, some Danish colleagues, some years ago, they made this uh, calculation from four different countries where they calculated a treatment frequency index in, in wheat. And there we can actually see that Denmark was very low compared to UK, France, and Germany. Of course, that can be all kinds of uncertainties here, but it is a quite, quite interesting that the Danish treatment frequency index was so low compared to those countries, and you don't see that large differences in, in the wheat yield uh, those years. And for transferability, yeah, it is possible, uh, but uh, it, the question is, is there political will uh, and or do you have very strong lobby groups which which go against, uh, against it if you introduce a pesticide tax? My recommendation would be that it's, it's probably a good idea to have a pesticide tax. You also need to have a, a strict approval system. Uh, then it is also a good idea to support new pesticide reduction smart technologies, use information through the consultants, uh, and then have some better indicators. So, just uh, if you go back, yeah, I was just 
curious. I mean, I don't know if you know anything, but I mean, this would be a nice area where the EU could implement a common policy. Yeah. That the CFP could have something about yeah. this, but is that is that totally out of reach? Is that I know, I know the the European Parliament. There are some interests. I actually, I was invited last year down by a Swedish member of the European Parliament from from the Social Democrats uh, for a small seminar and to demonstrate the effects of, of the Danish pesticide sex. So I think there's a small movement there, but of course it's a, it's a little bit uphill because again the agricultural lobby is so strong. Germany is also, uh, my colleague Helle was down uh, a couple of weeks ago in the German Ministry of Environment because they are also interested. And last year Die Grüne invited me down to the Bundestag and also tell about pesticide taxes. So there are some movements and I know France is also considering it. So, so there are some, some movements there. Uh, so it's not Im impossible that it, that it could happen. And I know Eurostat, they're working on, on uh, developing better indicators so we don't, don't just have this uh, uh, active ingredient, amounts of active ingredients, because that would also be a good step to get uh, further. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs>